So a very good evening to all of you. Uh, I welcome you all on behalf of Iskaris, Indian Society of Cornea and Keratin Refractive Surgeons in this uh, wonderful webinar, uh, wherein uh, there'll be a masterclass by Dr. Paul Rose on managing irregular cornea, the designs of contact lens that, uh, that he'll be discussing with us. Uh, in this webinar, we have with us uh, Professor J.S. Titial, who is the president of Iskaris and professor and head of the cataract, cornea, and refractive surgery services at RP Center Ames, New Delhi. He has numerous publications and huge experience in the field of cornea and refractive surgery and phacoid mastication, and he has received numerous awards, uh, which includes the American Academy Achievement and Senior Achievement Award, numerous awards from AIOS, from the Delhi Ophthalmic Society, numerous orations all over the country. He has the uh, has this uh, unique uh, you know feat of having the being the first Indian to have performed live cataract surgery at the American Society of uh, Cataract and Refractive Surgery uh, meeting. And uh, the most coveted Padma uh, from Government of India by President of India is something which uh, you know, we all are proud of that our teacher is a Padma Shri awardee. Dr. Namita. It's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Rishi Mohan, uh, again, RPC alumnus, done his MBBS from Malanazad Medical College. Uh, FRCS, uh, MAMS, and uh, he's also done five months training in FECO from the Prince Charles Eye Unit, uh, King Edward uh, Hospital, Windsor, UK, 1994. He was awarded the membership of the Academy of the Medical Sciences in 2006. He has numerous academic awards and uh, also ha had a gold medal and certificate of merit for the first position in Delhi University, as well as the best residence award from RP Center for Ophthalmic Sciences. Uh, he, he has held several uh, positions in the key leadership areas in various societies, uh, which include uh, the Sec Secretary of the Ophthalmic Research Association, RP Center Ames, a Joint Secretary of Delhi Ophthalmological Society, Member Scientific Committee, AIS, uh, Secretary of the uh, Indian Society of Cornea and Keratorefractive Surgeons, uh, Treasurer of the Eye Bank Association of India, uh, uh, member managing committee of AIOS uh, for two consecutive years, a joint secretary of Eye Bank Association of India, uh, president of the Delhi Ophthalmological Society, and currently he's the vice president of the uh, uh, Iskras uh, uh, for this term. So we welcome you, uh, Dr. Rishi. We also have with us Dr. Rajiv Mukherjee, who is the treasurer of Iskras and director and senior consultant Mukherjee Eye Clinic, uh, New Delhi. He is a visiting professor at Feenberg School of Medicine, Northwestern University, Chicago, USA. He's an established cornea and phaco surgeon and uh, has keen interest in contact lens uh, practice. Has presented many papers and courses at international and national level. He, and he's also the vice chairman of FBS AIOS. And uh, we welcome Dr. Rajiv Mukherjee. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Dr. Jyoti Dave Singh, uh, contact lens specialist, again qualified from UK and registered in UK, practicing contact lenses uh, since 1978 and started her career in UK. Uh, she started practicing in Mumbai in 1987 and is specializing in therapeutic contact lenses with particular attention to keratoconus. Uh, and currently is practicing in both the countries. She's fellow of the British Contact Lens Association and International Association of Contact Lens Educators adjunct faculty at uh, Charusat University Department of Optometric Gujarat, has formulated and manufactured contact lens solution under the brand name Contacare in, in India since 1984, uh, is the managing trustee of Jyoti Care Benevolent uh, Foundation, which attends to the eye health of underprivileged children in India. Uh, and on the lighter side, she's an active golfer and enjoys listening to Indian classical and devotional music. We also have with us the director of Guru Nanak Eye Center, New Delhi, Professor Kirti Singh, who has done her postgraduate training at RP Center Ames and then went on to do her glaucoma fellowship from Wilsai Hospital, uh, USA. She also had a Commonwealth Fellowship at uh, Moorfield Zai Hospital, London, and she's also recipient of WHO Fellowship in 2009. She practices in glaucoma and contact lens fitting and has conducted various CMEs and instruction courses and delivered more than 800 lectures at various states, the national and international level. She has published and authored three textbooks in contact lens and glaucoma. 
co-authored 12 books, have has a 55 index and over 75 peer-reviewed uh, publications. She has authored a volume of English poetry and contributed to Sahitya Kala can be a newsletter. She's also, uh, she has also worked as honorary radio compare for All India Radio and also in television and has been nominated Provost of MAMC in 2018. She has also received BN Khanna oration by Delhi of Society in 2019 and gold medal of uh, IRSI in the year 2019. We welcome Professor Kirti Singh. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Srikant Weikar, Professor and Head, uh, Postgraduate Department of Ophthalmology, Institute of Naval Medicine, INHS Aswini, Mumbai. He's done his MBBS from AFMC Pune in 1989 and MS of Filmology uh, again from the same institute in 1997 as well as uh, TNB and MNAMS in 1998. Uh, he's FMRF Shankar Netrale of Chennai and Senior Advisor of Filmology and Anterior Segment Microsurgeon and has numerous publications and has delivered numerous presentations in the various national and international conferences. Uh, I have with me uh, the co-moderator, uh, who is the chairperson of scientific committee, Iskeres Namrata Sharma. She is professor of ophthalmology in the Cornea Cataract and Refractive Surgery Services. She is also regional secretary of Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology, secretary of All India Ophthalmological Society, secretary of Eye Bank Association of India, and uh, of course has uh, numerous publications in various journals, various chapters. Has authored eleven books and has been actively involved in. Academics has numerous instruction courses at national and international level, and she is truly an academic person. So we welcome Professor Namrata Sharma and myself, Dr. Rajesh Sinha. I'm working as professor in the Cornea Lens and Refractive Surgery Services at RP Center Ames, and I'm the Honorary General Secretary of East Coast. So uh, uh, we have with us our guest speaker, and I will request uh, Dr. Jyoti Dave Singh to introduce uh, Dr. Paul Rose. Thank you. Thank you, 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 you Jerry. Yeah. Um, so it's my greatest pleasure to introduce my very dear friend, Paul. Thank you very much, Paul, for agreeing to present today. Despite your busy schedule, Paul is one of the kindest friends I am privileged to have, as he is always willing to share his vast knowledge to help restore this sight to thousands globally. Management of irregular cornea is a very, very important skill here in India. And Paul's presentation today will indeed go very far. Paul needs no introduction. However, please allow me to uh, inform you of some of his achievements. Dr. Paul Rose was educated at the University of Auckland, New Zealand, graduating in optometry in 1967 and again in 1969 with a Bachelor of Science in Psychology and Mathematics. So Paul is an, indeed a mathematician and therefore Paul, your wonderful designs. Um, Paul specializes in keratoconus and irregular cornea patients and is the designer of the Rose K family of lenses in 1998. He was elected as an inaugural fellow of the Cornea and Contact Lens Society of New Zealand and has served on this for a period of 10 years, including a term as president. In recognition for his contribution to the contact lens field, Paul was awarded honorary life membership of the New Zealand Contact Lens Society in 2011. Paul was awarded the Creative Design and Process Award by the CLMA USA in 2000 for innovation in lens design and manufacturing process to the enhancement of the contact lens society industry in India in, um, in you, uh, globally. And again in 2007 by EFCLIN, the largest association of contact lens manufacturers in the world for his contribution to the contact lens industry. Paul was also named as the first ever recipient of British Contact Lens Association Industry Award, which was launched in 2014. Um, to the honor and recognize the entrepreneurial work being carried out by individuals working in contact lens science 
Research and Technology in New Zealand in 2017 in the Queen's Honours List. He was appointed as the companion uh, of the New Zealand Order of Merit in recognition of his contributions to the field of ophthalmology and optometry. Under the Rose K brand, Paul has created several designs for the irregular cornea, including a post-surgical lens, a large diameter intralimbal lens, a small, very steep lens, uh, speci uh, specifically for the nipple cone, and a semi-scleral lens, and a soft lens. Paul's lens designs for the irregular cornea are now fitted in over 90 countries. And the Rose K brand is currently the most prescribed brand for the irregular cornea in the world. So now I hand over to Rajesh. Thank you for, uh, for an introduction uh, for a person who obviously needs no introduction. He has contributed immensely uh, in a field wherein uh, it is uh, a big challenge to manage such cases. And uh, irregular cornea is a big challenge for everyone, for all the ophthalmologists, for optometrists, for, for everyone. So uh, I salute for him for his contributions. And before we actually start his presentation, I'll request the president of Iskaris, Professor Tityal, sir, to say a few words. Yeah, thank you, Rajesh. Uh, good evening, friends. Indeed, uh, it's an honor to have uh, Paul with us today. And before we start, I'd like to wish uh, all our friends a very happy Independence Day for all Indians and our friends. I think this is a day we, we all have, you know, uh, uh, feelings which goes with all Indians to be independent. I think if you are independent, you should be free from all, uh, you know, aspects of your life also. And teaching is one of them. Unless you are independent thinking, you can't catch up what other person is talking about. And I understand uh, Paul will take us through the uh, contact and designs, which we ha all have used for uh, more than a decade, not touching two decades uh, as such. And uh, irregular cornea that Dr. Rajesh and Jyoti talked about, uh, difficult cases mm -hmm. for us surgically as well as uh, fitting contact lenses and managing these patients in the long term is a greater challenge for us. And today, uh, definitely, it will be an honor to listen to him and learn something which uh, we all are looking forward to. We welcome uh, Paul for this lecture. Thank you, sir. I request Dr. Paul to please share his slides. Uh, can you see that, uh, Rajesh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, well, that's a good start for the evening. Thank you very much. I'll just put that on full screen. Yeah. Uh, firstly, I feel very honored to be invited uh, amongst, obviously, a, a very honorable crowd of ophthalmologists tonight. I do appreciate you attending this webinar tonight. Um, the regular cornea has been my love for many years. Uh, we have a lot of keratoconus in New Zealand, so... When I started designing back in the 80s, it's become uh, uh, a lot of fun for me. I've enjoyed it, and I'm still doing it even today. So uh, hopefully tonight will give you some idea of my concepts of design of, of, of lenses and why you have to use different designs for different shapes of cornea. Um, <clears throat> must it clear my interest? Excuse me, I'm contracted as a consultant and a con I'm the designer of the Rose K family of lenses. When I'm talking tonight, I am going to talk about my lenses because it's the only ones that I really understand. Uh, but what, no matter what design or what brand you use to fit the irregular cornea, I think the principles that I'm going to show tonight will apply to no matter what type or, or brand that you are fitting. So what are we trying to achieve with contact lenses when we fit the irregular cornea? We're trying to minimize any damage to the cornea, particularly with delicate grafts, ideally not affect the normal corneal metabolism and to provide good tear exchange. I still believe that is very important. We have obviously good, good acuity and provide comfort and stability. And to do that, I believe the, the more you align the cornea with the back surface of the lens, the more chance you've got of achieving these goals that are put up there. So 
This contact lens design really important to fit the irregular cornea. Can we simply use just one design? I don't believe we can. I don't think you can just take one design and put it on any shape of irregular cornea. So what has come about, and, and since I started designing for keratoconus back in 1990, when I designed initially, I thought that one design would fit most irregular corneas, but I soon found out that it didn't fit grass well, it didn't fit um, DMD or um, pellucid well, and it was not good when we had oblate corneas. So I then subsequently had to come up with different designs for different conditions. And now I have actually six different designs, five of which are rigid and one of which is soft. So it means that chosen correctly, I believe that you can fit uh, the irregular cornea from one of the, five, of the six designs. So why is design important? That's what I want to talk about tonight. So just to make you think about why is design important? We tend to talk about five different types of irregular cornea. Uh, the oval cone, the nipple cone, pellucid globus, and any post-surgical condition. If you have these smaller areas of distortion, particularly the nipple cone, but even the oval cone, you can often get away with fitting very successfully smaller lenses like the keratoconus lens or, or the nipple cone lens. But when you get to these larger areas of distortion, it's very, very difficult to get success with these smaller lens designs. And you have to go to either bigger corneal lens designs with bigger diameters or to a semi-scleral or scleral lens design to get a successful outcome. So nipple cones um, are more common in some countries than others. And in Japan, they're quite common, but tend to be worldwide about five to 10% of the cones that you see. So if you have a, a cone that looks like this, which is a very, very small cone, less than five millimeters, uh, very steep, like a volcano in the middle, and you have a lot of normal cornea surrounding it. The most common cone we see uh, around the world is the oval cone, which is usually greater than five millimeters in diameter, and it's usually descended down inferiorly a little bit. So in that case, you're going to use uh, my original design, uh, the Rose K, the keratoconic design. If you have post-surgical conditions, so often they are oblate centrally and the keratoconic designs will not work on these conditions at all. You need to go to a bigger diameter and the post-graph design is 10.4 millimeters, although you can go even bigger than that still. I used to advocate uh, before we got into using semi-scleral designs, uh, large corneal designs for these conditions. But if I get pellucid or globus now, I immediately move to a semi-scleral design. So I use my XL corneal scleral design. I just want to spend a moment talking about two conditions that are very commonly confused. Why I'm going to talk about them is that these two conditions require different lenses. If you've got pellucid, you need to go to a semi-scleral design. If you have an oval cone, your first choice, I believe, should be a corneal lens design. So just to talk very briefly about the differences. With keratoconus, usually the Ks are in the, in the flattest meridian are steeper than 8.0. And you have uh, a, a typical pattern like this with often some normal cornea between the base of the cone and the limbus. Whereas in pellucid, you don't have normal cornea down here at all. The steepening does not usually extend right down into the limbal zone. You also very frequently have with the rule stigmatism, which means that your cornea is flatter horizontally and it's steeper vertically. So when you put a contact lens onto it, it bears in the horizontal meridian and lifts off in the vertical meridian. With pellucid, you can see here, this is a very good sketch of pellucid. Our steepening is much more inferior, right down near the limbus. And it's, it's always described as two birds kissing, but in fact, that's not always typical of pellucid. It can look like a low oval cone as well. One thing that's that is just about always the case, you have high amounts of against the rule of stigmatism, which means that in the horizontal meridian, you're steeper. In the vertical meridian, you're flatter. And it says again, it's very important. 
I see so many people as I traveled around the world trying to fit pollution with corneal lenses. It will not work. And uh, they eventually give up. Uh, whereas if they'd used a semi-scleral lens, they would have got a successful result. This is what we tried to do before we had semi-scleral lenses. We had to misfit with corneal lenses. You can see how it's impacting onto the lower cornea here. This would often cause staining. We've got pooling here. As I said, your tightest meridian in pellucid is vertically and your steepest meridian. So the lens tends to lift off here and here. With the keratoconus, it's exactly the opposite. The lens often lifts off inferiorly, as you can see here. But if you go to a lens like XL, you can get a very nice alignment. This is where we start, need to judge the base curve because we don't worry about what's happening centrally with the foot. We have to worry about the highest point on the cornea, which in pellucid is very inferior. I want to spend just a moment talking about topographies because so often as I traveled around, people would present me with topographies such as this and say, what lens would you use on it? Now, looking at those maps, I can't tell whether that is a cone, whether it's pellucid, whether it's globus. And that is because the topography has faulted to what we call the absolute or standard scale. By simply changing the scale to what's called the normalized scale, we get a completely different map. These maps are the same, but here, anything steeper then 6.75 is represented in one color. So we don't see the differentiation of the cone or where the apex of the cone is. So please, when you're looking at maps, make sure you use the normalized scale, not the absolute scale that the, that the topographer will choose. Otherwise, it's very difficult to tell the condition that you're fitting. So just to summarize that, the absolute or standard scale is set by the topographer and can skew the color range and make it very difficult to mask the details of the cornea. The normalized scale only includes the range of curvature from the flattest to the steepest values and therefore gives you a much better range to actually look at what's happening on the cornea and analyze the, what the actual shape of the eye is. The other thing you can look at is either using the uh, absolute and the normalized scale here, you can see the difference. This is the same maps, absolute, normalized, but they don't look like the same maps, absolute, normalized. So I always prefer to use the normalized setting. The other thing to consider is the tangential axial. If you set the topographer on tangential, that talks about shape, axial talks about power. And you can see this map, and this map are exactly the same map. It's just changed from tangential setting to axial setting. So axial maps tend to descent, exaggerate the size of the cone and the decentration of the cone. I don't care which one you use, but I find I prefer tangential maps because when you put a contact lens on the eye, it gives you a much better impression of what the map shows. So you get a, a fluorescent pattern that corresponds with the map. So in, in summary, uh, I find the program is relatively accurate for judging the condition. However, until you place a contact lens on the eye, it's very difficult to know exactly what is going to happen uh, with, with that cornea. So where do you begin? You identify the condition you're fitting, try to get that correct, choose the appropriate design, and then you follow my five-step fitting system. So if we take a, a very, very simple, normal, uh, regular Case here, 17 year old male presents a poor revision over the last two years, has a history of allergies and eye rubbing. Uh, here's his maps. So, if we look at these maps, what have we got? What design would you use for these maps? This is an oval cone. We're going to use the keratoconic design because it has a slightly larger back optic than the nipple cone and it's going to suit this condition better. So I'm not going to go into too much detail with the fitting. Uh, I, I'm going to touch it very briefly, uh, but still talk about design. So when you're ordering uh, the lens, you talk about the design, the base curve, the edge lift value, which controls how the lens flattens out to the edge of the lens, the diameter, and the power. 
And I advocate a five-step fitting system and you go through it in this order. You, you start with the central fit and then you go to the peripheral fit, the diameter location, the lens movement. And once you become familiar with, with the uh, of fitting of eye designs, there's been many studies over the last 20 odd years to show that fitters expect to get over an 80% success rate with their first ordered lens. So what are we trying to do? We are trying with a corneal lens to get, achieve light feather touch, as you see here. Now, in fact, it's, it's not touch because we still have about 20 to 30 microns clearance here. It's just that you don't have enough fluorescent to get fluorescence. This is too steep. We'd need to flatten the base curve. And this is getting too flat here. We'd have to actually go steeper. Where here we'd have to go flatter. But this is what we're trying to aim to get. Um, if a patient comes in and you see this caused by the contact lens, uh, you, you know you've got a, a poor fitting lens, it's too flat. And if you leave it standing like this, you'll eventually end up with scar tissue over the apex of the cone, exactly what you don't want. So if you see uh, standing centrally over the cone, you know you have to go steeper with your base curd. The peripheral fit is the most important part of the fit. It controls the location, it controls the movement of the lens, of corneal lens, uh, and it also controls how much tear is exchanged from the central part of the lens out to the edge of the lens. This is an ideal looking edge lift. So this is getting too tight, you can see here. We're not going to get tear exchanged from the center of that lens. This is looking optimum. We've got a lovely peripheral band of fluorescent with a blink, these tears are going to exchange. And this is getting too open now. Often when the edge lift is too open, you see it lifting off from the edge and you start to see small bubbles entering under the edge of the lens. You need to go tighter in that fin. So here's a regular rigid design. This is just a normal corneal design fitted on keratoconus. And you can see the damage it's doing to the corneal epithelium simply because the back optic zone of this lens is too big and the peripheral system is too tight. And this lens is impacting severely onto the corneal epithelium. What if we get maps that look like these? Hopefully we would all agree these are nipple, typical nipple cone maps where you have a large area of normal cornea and you have a small area often very central or paracentral within a, one millimeter of the line of sight. Um, these are very typical maps. What are you going to use the a nipple cone? You're going to use the nipple cone design, which has a very small back optic with very rapid flattening to match the shape of that cornea. So why is lens design important? With oval keratoconus, you can get away with a larger back optic. You get shallow pools here around the base of the cone and you still get tear exchange to, from the central area out to the edge of the lens. But if you try to fit a nipple cone or a more advanced oval cone, these pools at the base of the cone become much deeper. This area out here becomes much tighter. You don't get exchange of tears. This is the cornea, central cornea becomes anoxic. It becomes edematous and pushes up on the back of the lens. Whereas if you go to a smaller back optic, you can much more easily align the cornea with the back surface of the lens and get rid of these deep pools. Unfortunately, this would not move, so we have to leave some slop in the optic zone so with the blink, the lens actually moves on the cornea. So here's a nipple cone fitted with a regular keratoconus design. And you can see we've got bearing on the apex, we've got a, quite a deep pool around the base of the cone. We've got a very wide, dark area where we're not gonna get any exchange of tears. We've got a tight peripheral system. And when you took the lens off, you can see the lens has been binding to the cornea. It's already starting to produce central edema. And that's gonna be right over the pupil, exactly what you don't want. If you have an OCT, you can actually look at the edge of the lens and you can see how the edge of that lens is compressing up the corneal epithelium simply because the design is not correct for the shape of cornea. 
So if you fit a nipple comb with a regular keratoconus design, you can cause a lot of damage to the apex of the cone. And this is typically what you see, deep, deep uh, uh, penetration with fluorescent here. I'll just run that video back again. Quite a deep pool of cone, bubbles trapped, the lens is not moving, you're not going to get tear exchange, and therefore you end up with this very, very deep staining, uh, even goes down into the stroma. If you fit this with a smaller back optic, this is a Rose KNC design, we've got some movement, we're getting tear exchange, and this has taken about a month after that was refitted, and you can see immediately we've resolved that staining over that area. So this is why it's very important to identify the shape of cornea you're fitting. Again here, a nipple cone, wrong design. This is going to actually bind on the cornea. We're much too tight in that periphery here. And if we compare the two designs on exactly the same eye, this is the keratoconic design, and this is the nipple cone design on the same cornea. So you can notice here, the pooling's greater than here. The edge lift is much better here than here. And the movement of this lens on the right is better than this one. So we're going to get good tear exchange here, not such good tear exchange here. This is going to work better than this will work. So you might say, well, the fit is going larger and larger. And we, we know you go to American conferences and all they talk about is scleral lenses. You know, you think that we've forgotten about corneal lenses. I just don't see a case where you should cover up the whole cornea when you've only got a small section like a nipple cone, which is a very small percentage of the cornea, which you need to correct. So I will always still try a corneal lens before I go to a larger semi-scleral design. Moving on to the post-graph design, and it's very hard to give you a map because they're all different, but very often they look like this with the central area being more oblate. So we're going to talk about the post-surgical design now, or the post-graft design. What's its primary indications? It's post-graft, post-laser, or BRK, basically any surgery, and secondary indications of large descended oval cones. So if you've got a cone that descends down a long way, and is very large, uh, this design can work quite well on that as well. So here's the post-graft design um, lens fitted uh, this, sorry, this is a normal lens fitted over a post graft. And you can see it's centrally very oblate. So it causes this pooling here, which you often get bubbles. You can see the edge of the graft uh, just here. So it's bearing on the edge of the graft with a large pool centrally. This is very typical if you try to use a regular design uh, on a, a post surgical cornea. If we look here, uh, sorry, I'll just go back there. This is a, a Rose KPG with reverse geometry. So what, what is a reverse geometry? It basically keeps the central part of the lens much flatter. Then you have one steeper curve to get over the edge of the graft, and then you have a high edge lift. So that negates a lot of the pooling that you get centrally over those bladed areas. So if you've got an oblate cornea, then a regular design doesn't work. You've got to consider a, a reverse geometry lens like post-graft uh, Rose K. Here is it fitted over a corneal ring insert, just a single one here. This would be very successful. Then just sitting up nicely, we have nice edge lift. Uh, again, a good lens for a corneal insert. Here it's over a low oval cone. Here's the cone here. Uh, we're getting quite a lot of pooling. It doesn't seem to matter too much here. This has a 350 cylinder on the front to correct some residual astigmatism. Uh, laser mark shows you we're not getting any rotation in that lens really at all. It's hardly moving on the blink. Again, would be a very successful result. Here it's fitted over a post LASIK fitting. It's the edge of the ablation zone here and here. Again, reverse geometry, even though we've got a very oblate cornea, we're not seeing that pulling centrally because we have kept that Sag sagittal height of the lens centrally much lower than a normal design. The IC design is, is my uh, last corneal lens design I'm going to talk about. It's a very similar design to the post graph design, but it's just a bit bigger and has slightly uh, larger op back optic zone and tighter peripheral curves. And we tend to use it 
in early polluted globus or in some LASIK cases, you can get away with it. So here is the uh, IC design. You can see it optimized in most of the cornea. Uh, patient looks straight, it obviously will advance that video here. So it occupies most of the cornea. Uh, this is as I said, an early cure on early curative globus here. So here is the IC design on a large oval cone. You can see the size of the cone here. Uh, the first lens, this was not my fitting, was sent to me from another fitter. You can see here the lens is flat, it's a 6 8 base. The second base they used was 6 6, still flat. Third base they used was 6 6, still flat, but they've opened up the edge lift, so this is tight. Here we're starting to see a nice edge lift because they've increased the edge lift. And finally, they went to a 6 4 base. We've got light apical touch or feather touch, but we're not really getting touch, as I mentioned before. But the periphery is too tight. So the final lens, what we would want is this base curve with this increased lift here, and that would give us an excellent result. So what happens when you use the wrong design? This was a, a picture sent to me from a fitter actually in the States who had bought the IC trial set, put it on, followed the fitting guide and sent me this and said, what do I think of the fitting? It is a very poor fitting. Here's the nipple cone, or this is the cone apex here. It's very tight in the periphery, has a very large, huge pull, and you can see the damage it's already doing around the edge of the lens. So I asked him to send me the map. Here was the map. So what did he have? He had a nipple cone. He had used the wrong design. He should have used a design that had a very, very small back optic with very high edge lift but he's used a lens with a very large back optic with very little edge lift. So he's never going to be successful on this cornea with the IC design. So here's another one. This is a very early cone. Um, what, what would I say? It's a very early oval keratoconus, typical shape of oval keratoconus. The fitted decide to use the IC design on it. You can see the apex of the cone here. Again, the lens is not fitting well. It has a very large optic area, a very, very tight periphery. These tears are not going to exchange. And when you have a tight periphery, the lens tends to sit very low. It's impacting into the lower limbus and on a blink, it won't move. So I said to the fitter, please refit it in a keratoconic design and my keratoconus design, which has a smaller back optic with much more rapid flattening. And this is the result he got, a much, much nicer fluorescent pattern than we had with the IC design. I want to move on to now to my corneal scleral design. So just so we're on the page, on the same page, corneal lenses basically have no tear reserve, the tear reserve changes, and you have all the bearing on the cornea. Corneal sclerals share their bearing on the cornea and sclera, and they have limited tear exchange. Sclerals, and they can be mini sclerals or large sclerals, uh, and large sclerals have almost unlimited tear reservoir, and all the bearing is on the sclera. So basically, the lens vaults over the cornea, you don't touch it, and you land the lens on the conjunctiva. Whereas with a corneal sclera, you land the lens on the cornea, still just inside the limbus. So with XL, this is the design. It's a corneal scleral lens. So why the dramatic increase in use of sclerals and semi-sclerals over the past five years? What factors have driven this change? The main factor is the comfort and stability and stable vision. These lenses are just about initially comfortable as a soft lens. I think they're easy to fit. Uh, they're ideal for dusty or, or environments, dry eyes, and do remember a better financial return for the laboratories. So the laboratories tend to want to promote these lenses uh, simply because uh, their returns uh, are much better than corneal lenses. But is there any possible downside to fitting these larger lenses? Here was a paper that was discussed at the GSLS conference in 2017, conducted by uh, Young and Sorba. They, they conducted a survey on a, a, about 200 patients of the respondents, over a quarter experience midday fogging, where you have to take the lens out, refill it and put it back again. 
Nimble hyperemia was present in nearly one in four cases, and also corneal staining was significant in over 13% of cases. Is that acceptable? Also, Pat Caroline referred to conjunctival prolapse in 25 to 30% of cases of scleral lens wearers. So what are the primary indications for a scleral lens? These larger areas of distortion where you can't fit successfully with a corneal lens. Very, very difficult to fit these conditions with a corneal lens. Excel can be used on these conditions, but once again, it's not my first option. I always prefer to try corneal lenses, unless of course a patient has tried them before and can't tolerate them, then I would move immediately to the Excel design. So the way a corneal scleral works is you land the lens just inside the limbus. It's a, a, here's the black area shows the landing zone. It's less than one millimeter wide. You want clearance, you don't want feather touch, you want about a 30 to 60 micron clearance over the highest point on the cornea. And then you have fluorescent flushing, uh, or sorry, with tears flushing in and out of this area with blinking. So you can see you have an edge lift. With a scleral lens, you would not see fluorescent like this underneath the edge of the lens at all. Well, you can get this with a correct fitting corneal scleral lens. If you have an OCT, you can see the landing zone here is just inside the limbus, and then the lens scoots off, and you have tear exchange out beyond that. If you want to check where the lens is the highest here, you should have between a 30 minimum to a maximum 60 micron clearance over that part of the fitting. These two are 0.1 flat. I can still see the touch here. You want to basically choose the flattest base curve that shows no touch. So these are about point, both these lenses are about 0.12 flat. This is a cone. This is a graft where we often see the highest point along the edge of the graft, either just inside or just outside the edge of the graft. So the peripheral fit, you're trying to achieve that fluorescence so you can still see the uh, uh, conjunctival vessels through the fluorescent, and the, the size of the lens is very similar to a soft lens. So for bigger corneas, you make the lens bigger, smaller corneas, you make the lens smaller. If you have an OCT, you can look at the edge of the lens you know, around the clock to see what's happening. You should see the ends of the lens not bearing like this. This is not sufficient lift. This is impacting a lot. You're not going to get tear exchange here. And this lift is now getting excessive. That would be uncomfortable for the patient and uh, the lens would move around excessively. So we don't normally talk about lens movement with semi-scleral designs at all, but with corneal sclerals and with Excel, I like to see some movement. So get the patient to look up and blink. And you should see a movement of about 0.5 to one millimeter when it first goes in. That will settle down to be less than that, but that's what you're trying to achieve by changing some factors. I won't go into ones you change, but by changing factors like the edge lift and the base curve, you can change the movement. So here's the pellucid that looks quite good as a fit. Where are we judging the base curve? Not here centrally, we forget this. We're judging it inferiorly here where the highest point on the pellucid is. And you can see that little bubble, that is going in and will eventually cause bubbling in the central area of the lens because the lens is slightly flat. So this is about 0.12 flat, um, which would eventually cause problems. You never remove the lens with the sucker or the plunger centrally, uh, otherwise the eye tends to follow it. You always want to put this, the plunger when you're taking these lenses out as far as you can towards the edge of the lens as you see here. And with XL, it should be come out quite simply, as you see here. You shouldn't, if the lens is fitted correctly, it should come out as easily as that. You should not have to use excessive force to remove the lens. I talked briefly about conjunctival prolapse uh, with Pat Caroline, and I'm sure you've all seen it where in scleral lens, the conjunctiva gets sucked back under and often eventually grows or um, combines with the cornea and physically has to be removed surgically if it becomes a problem. Cannot occur with a corneal scleral design. 
Why? Because the conjunctiva is not trapped underneath the lens. The conjunctiva is still free out here. It's, whereas with a scleral lens, the edge of the lens, the conjunctiva is trapped underneath the back optic zone, which tends to suck the conjunctiva back uh, onto the cornea. This is a picture I took of a scleral lens that was fitted to a girl. Uh, she was traveling around the world and she came in to see me because she was saying that at the end of the day, she couldn't see well. This was the graft. This, this lens, this graft was about two years old. Um, the patient had only had this lens for about nine months. So if you're going to use large semi-scleral lenses on grafts, you have to watch them very, very closely and limit the wearing time until you're comfortable the cornea is getting sufficient oxygen. There are some practitioners who won't fit semi-scleral lenses or lenses that uh, bolt the cornea on grafts because of the risk. So what are the advantages of a corneal scleral design over a scleral design? Here's what I see. Less binding, you get some movement. The conjunctival compression is much less than with sclerals. There is evidence on a couple of papers, which I won't go into, that scleral lenses can increase the interocular pressure. So if you're going to fit scleral lenses, you have to be aware of that and make sure that you're not causing glaucoma or problems to the disc. Significantly more exchange than sclerals. So you get the sclerals very, very little exchange of tears. Um, and that gets less and less during the wearing time. The lens continues to settle back over the whole wearing time. You get some movement to refresh the tear layer under the lens, which poses less of a risk for corneal grafts than scleral lens. And another thing, when they come in for a check, you can put fluorescent onto the uh, conjunctiva, a few blinks manipulate the lens, and you should be able to see fluorescent flow underneath the lens. So you don't have to take the lens out um, to actually check the cornea. Very, very efficient to fit. Normally within 20 minutes, they settle down to their final resting position, where sclerals often take several hours to settle down to there because you're landing the lens on the conjunctiva, which is very soft. So that takes much longer to settle down. No conjunctival um, prolapse or corneal bogging, you can't get that. Midday fogging is less uh, common than with uh, scleral lenses, which means you don't have to take the lens out and refill it as frequently as you do with scleral lenses. Uh, don't need it to be as large if you're landing the lens on a soft membrane like the conjunctiva, you need to have a bigger support area. So typically sclerals have to be larger than corneal sclerals, and therefore also they're easier to remove as I showed before. So why do I prefer corneal sclerals over sclerals? They can be used in the majority of cases where a scleral lens is indicated and give the same advantages of comfort and stability that sclerals provide without many of the potential downsides that setting off the cornea can cause. Finally, I want to talk about my soft lens design. Is a soft lens really a viable option for the irregular cornea? How do they work? Well, here's a topography with no lens on here, and you can see we have a lot of irregular, irregularity on that cornea. Even by putting a plus 050 disposable lens on here, we have made the stigmatism more regular. Still some irregularity, but it's more regular. By thickening the lens up further to 0.35 uh, center thickness, this would be under 0.1 of a center thickness, probably about 0.08. So 0.35, we've so suddenly the irregular astigmatism becomes regular. We haven't reduced the amount of astigmatism, but then we can correct the astigmatism on the front surface of the soft lens. So all we're doing is taking a regular astigmatism, making the lens thick enough so it doesn't follow the corneal shapes exactly, and therefore we've made the astigmatism regular. So it also can reduce the degree of astigmatism. The spectacle correction for this person uh, had a 250 cell by putting a 0.35 center thickness rose case soft on, it came down to half a doctor of cylinder. Because you don't get, uh, that draping doesn't follow the cornea exactly, it tends to have it retain its own shape because of its thickness. Patient selection is very important. Those patients that have failed with the regular uh, GP lenses due to tolerance or fit, and so on, they just don't want to try GP lenses or gas permeable lenses, rigid lenses again. 
first time contact lens, whereas early to moderate irregular corneas that don't work uh, on advanced corneas, in my opinion. Patients using piggyback systems often do okay with the big soft lens and subsequent to corneal surgery. But beware, these lenses will not provide a sufficient oxygen to the cornea for 12 hours of everyday wear. So if you're fitting them on uh, something like a graft, you have to limit the wearing time. Um, these lenses uh, cannot possibly, even in a silicon hydrodon material, will not give you good uh, wearing, uh, enough uh, oxygen to the cornea to give you 12 hours a day wearing. So patients wearing irregular cornea, uh, uh, corneas are wearing conventional soft lenses, not getting good enough vision. By thickening up, we can get their acuity better. Working in dusty environments where you, they can't wear a rigid lens for their irregular cornea or where they want more stability. And it's important that so with these lenses, uh, we tend to use trial sets, although I understand from Jody, she fits them empirically off the fitting guide. But if you do fit many of these, it's ideal to have a, a trial set to make sure that you can achieve reasonable vision at the fitting. A contraindication to fit is where you can't achieve good level of vision at the fitting. The way you fit these lenses is they actually fit, they tend to actually fit flatter than the base curve. So if the mean K was seven, you would fit a base curve of around eight because you want the back surface of the contact lens to contact well onto the epithelium of the cornea. Because then when the patient blinks, you're not going to get a change of vision. Here, if you fit a lens and you see it's, they tend to hold their own shape because of the thickness here. If you have a tear layer like this behind, every time the patient blinks, this pushes up and down and you get variable vision. So you will not get good vision. So it's important with these lenses that you have to fit them relatively flat. So you're looking at about one millimeter on blinking. Now that's much more than a normal soft lens. But the way these patients get wearing time is they have to get tear exchange. With a normal, uh, normal, you don't have to get wear, uh, tear exchange. I just go back there. So with a normal soft lens, you don't tend to get much tear exchange. You get most of the oxygen or tears through the lens. With this lens, you have to achieve tear exchange. So just want to finish up with myths and assumptions on soft lenses. You often hear that soft lenses are only use in, useful in early keratoconus, and I'll show you a case in a moment where that's not the case. Soft lenses require multiple lenses to get this description correct. Typically, in a survey I did, a, it was about 2.5 lenses uh, were needed to be fitted to get a successful fit which is much higher than a rigid. So that is actually true. Acuity will never be as good as with soft lenses or with rigid lenses. Typically, it can be as good, but uh, many cases it's not as good and that anyone can fit them. Rose K2 soft does require some expertise. You have to judge the fitting. It's not like a normal soft lens where you only have one or two bases uh, like a daily wear lens. So this is just a case of, uh, I'm gonna quote, uh, before I wrap it up tonight, of uh, soft lenses are only useful in early keratoconus. This was a 23-year-old male, moderate bilateral keratoconus. Uh, the left eye was worse than the right, and he was highly atopic, worked on a building site, and found that corneal lenses were impractical in his working con condition. He found that spectacles did not provide a reasonably sufficient vision gain, and he didn't tolerate them well, so he couldn't wear those in his working place as well couldn't wear uh, rigid contact lenses that caused excessive tearing. And again, his environment was not conducive to uh, rigid corneal lenses. An area vision 615 and 680, uh, the mean case from the topography uh, around 68 and 61. So knowing that, here's a fitting guide, which says you're going to add around about a one plus one to the mean K. So the first indicated lens on the right eye was 78, and on the left, seven, four. So if we look at the right eye, the first lens showed uh, minimum movement, good location and comfort. So they tried a slightly flatter lens, which gave good movement, location and good comfort. So they ended up with uh, an 8.0 base uh, with a small amount of cylinder and they achieved six, seven, five vision. 
The left eye, without going through it in too much detail, they ended up with a 7.6 base curve as the best fitted lens and a high cell minus five cell, and they achieved a, a, a vision of 618. So what was achieved in this case? The patient was delighted with the outcome um, and for, was able to wear these lenses in his working situation up to about 10 hours a day, which is absolutely delighted. So if you look at the unaided vision, 615 came to 675, 680 came to 618, which you may not think is very good, but for the patient, the improvement was enough to get him through and he was delighted with the results. So a lot to take on there. There is a website if you ever want to look at it, www.rosekaylens.com. There's a practitioner's section there that gives you a lot of, on there's some video fitting guides. I haven't gone into much detail with the fitting tonight. I've just glanced over it. There's a, a Rose K2 fitting tips telling you that when you get stuck, what to do. Uh, there's a fitting guides and other downloads there. But in that section, if you go to fitting guides and other downloads, you may need to use this password, rkprac07. If you forget it, just uh, contact Jody and she'll be able to give it to you. And you can download all my guides there. So just to finish up, just a couple of studies that came out of Turkey, which I think wraps it up for me. Here was a study on over a thousand eyes where they had fitted with some type of contact lens and they showed that they achieved in, in their cases, nearly 99% uh, of success was achieved and delayed the need for surgery. So contact lenses uh, certainly uh, are very useful on the irregular cornea and can delay the need for surgery quite dramatically. Another study done independently on Rose K, and there's plenty on, on my website if you want to look them up uh, on a range of, uh, of a range of irregular corneas. And again, they found that the designs were successful at visit of rehabilitating about 100% of moderate and 96% of severe keratocytes in this study. Again, a, a good result. So why has the why lens design, as Jody mentioned, now fitted in over 70 countries? I mean, there are so many contact lens designs around the world for the regular cornea. Why has this design uh, been taken up around the world? I think it's a couple of reasons. A simplified fitting system, a five-step fitting system, which if you follow, you will probably, once you get an idea of what's going on, you've got a relatively good chance of getting a, a good success rate. But I also think by offering a complete range of designs for fitting different profiles, that is a key in getting success. So I think that's been a very important factor. My aim was to put it into the hands so that as long as you could understand a fluorescent pattern, you would be able to fit my design. So my, I think my designs have been taken up by a lot of practitioners who struggled with fitting their regular cornea in the past. So just to wrap it up, my sincere thanks to your society for giving me the, the opportunity to present to you. I feel very honored to be in such an honorable company. I do appreciate it very much. And I do thank you for attending today. This is a picture of um, where I have a, a beach house near the beach, a very beautiful part of New Zealand. Once this crazy COVID settles down, I hope some of you do make it out to our lovely country. This is called Cathedral Cove on the Coromandel Peninsula. So uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. And I do look forward to talking with you uh, if you have any questions. Thank you. Back to you, Rajesh. Thanks, Paul. It was a wonderful presentation and very nicely covered. There's so many different case scenarios. Uh, will request Professor Tedialsa to say something? I'm just trying to stop my share, screen sharing, which is not working. Yeah, it was a delight to listen to uh, Dr. Paul. And um, it was a complete, you know, <clears throat> you can say a simplified way to approach irregular corneas. And looking into his designs, uh, most cases can be fitted with these lenses. That is the best part of... Uh, uh, rose K designs and it is I think one thing which I have learned today is you know the, apart from uh, using the topography uh, for the contact lens fitting 
you need to have other assessment which we have been doing uh, regularly like entry segment oct especially for uh, you know uh, scleral and semi scleral contact lenses entry segment oct really helps you to look into a central peripheral and the you know uh, area which is beyond that edge area and that really helps you in uh, making a good decision and we all know contact lens fitting does take a time uh, your chair time would be a very very important for you and for a patient if that is taken care of most patients can be satisfied because these are patient they can't live without contact lenses so we have to give a contact lenses and we have to look for a best option for them and i think the practice we have done with the rose scale lenses really gives a very very nice option for these patients and recently now uh, we have more patient with the post surgical uh, requirement of contact lens these are really difficult cases and you require a lot of uh, manipulations uh, to be done in the contact lens designs but yes uh, it was a wonderful learning from you uh, paul and uh, we look forward to uh, listening to you in future also along with jyoti yeah thank you doctor one thing um, practitioners often say to me do you need an oct to successfully fit lenses i find octs very useful in um, verifying your final fit so you know they're very time consuming the fact that you have to look around in various areas and so uh, what uh, my answer is use fluorescent but that very good once you think you've got your final lens an oct is very good to be able to look around the clock but very time consuming if you try to use them for fitting every lens that would be my experience with those well there have been many people watching you and listening to you so there are many questions for you but before that i would like to have uh, the experience of our panelists i will start with jyoti who has uh, uh, loads of experience on these lenses and uh, you know she really helped us initially uh, to start the fitting of roske lenses and all the various designs so i would like to listen uh, listen from you regarding your experience and uh, uh, some more tips from you thank you rajesh uh, thank you the um, secretary and uh, isc krs uh, members for giving me this opportunity here to be on your prestigious panel um, yes i've had a tremendous experience with rose scale lenses in india and i do find that uh, once the patient gets a good fitting rose scale lens he is not going to move out of this design uh, why because he is getting excellent comfort the vision is as good as the pinhole and uh, he um, he will continue forever um, some of my patients have gone Uh, wearing these lenses for almost 20 25 years and uh, not required any surgery and uh, rajesh the best thing the best thing possible is for patients uh, to be uh, looked after by um, the co management of ophthalmologists and optometrists um the reason being that the optometrist will actually do most of the work and uh, as paul said it's very time consuming the optometrist can actually do all the oct work so they can do all the workups before fitting the when the final fitting comes the ophthalmologist and the optometrist together can decide on the final fitting and of course the post care the uh, once the lenses are dispensed the aftercare is really very very important so in my experience um, uh, working with an ophthalmologist is the best thing that can happen it can save a lot of chair time yeah. the second thing uh, she has also means of using all sorts of contact lenses ma'am please Thank you. As usual, Dr. Paul, it's a pleasure listening to you. You make it sound so simple, and it is not actually so simple. So much time is taken in fitting the lens, but uh, it's very correct. These patients are so dependent on lens, and they're so grateful for this that it's at that time is actually a pleasure. So I would just say one more, two things about Rose K, which I really liked was the uh, the modifications you had in the edge lift. i think that made all the difference you know i have gone through fitting rgp lenses 
two decades ago and the edge tech modifications which you have and your constant innovation in the irregular cornea and now the soft lens so these just widened the array of patients which we could fit and the edge depth as jyoti said you know they they made the comfort and the tearfulness change so good i have two questions for you dr paul one is uh, what is the difference you feel if you fit the contact lens post collagen cross linking so after cross linking uh, yes. the length of time you have to wait or do you have to change the fit no no uh, no, no the fit uh, after let's say let's say 3 to 6 months post collagen cross linking when you do the fitting the patients who were wearing contact lens before so post uh, pre and post cross linking what is the difference you find um sometimes very little if you look at the stats with cross linking you only get typically a 0.1 to 0.2 maybe 0.3 flattening over that central area it's not mm-hmm. a lot mm-hmm. so um i've seen patients who have gone straight back to their old lenses professor with it with no problems at all typically you have to go fractionally flat if you want to get a perfect but um sometimes they can wear their old lenses quite successfully actually what i found, we did a study in our center way back 3 4, 4 years ago and we found that yeah they did go a little flatter but the most uh, amazing discovery which we made was that these patients who were comfortable with the let's say 2 to 3 hours of fit previous to the cross linking post cross linking the time of comfort this increased dramatically they were much more comfortable with the same lens or a little flatter lens but they could use it more comfortably make maybe the cornea had become more compact and you know more rigid in a way so the fitting was virtually similar but the time which these patients could use had increased improved did you uh, any had find had the same finding i would agree i think um we know that with cross linking we often uh, the nerve the nerves are affected in the cornea so i think initially you you have a less sensitive cornea and you can measure that mm-hmm. also i think you have a cornea reacts less to and becomes less edematous so i don't think you yeah. have the Let's same let's last said yeah yeah so yes I, i agree that after cross linking they can often wear lenses even more successfully and longer than before cross linking and i have to one another thing over here only i would just like to add one thing that prosit uh, under prosit it there was a thesis done um, i was also a part of that and in that we found out that uh, there was uh, some reduction in astigmatism in all these cases because the k max reduced and the k minimum had a slight increase so the, there was a reduction in astigmatism and the patients were more tolerant and yes the time of uh, yeah the tolerance time. yeah the tolerance was much more it's not only the corneal nerves you know because we were doing it after 6 months of cross linking by that time the corneal nerves have pretty much come back <laughs> uh the next question was you know really it's little more practical in a rose scale lens uh, I, it's more for jyoti than for paul how long do you think in indian climates that the rose scale one patient who buys you know takes care of it very well how long would it last two years three years or less jyoti you want to answer that you mute you are mute you have to unmute jyoti i'd say definitely two years uh, but uh, that is if the corneal curvature has not changed yeah of course uh, yes and and uh, the fact is that in india the contact lens solutions available are uh, very erratic and uh, sometimes the patients are using soft lens solutions to clean the lenses and therefore the lens surface which is a highly sensitive material on a highly sensitive material will get ruined much much more faster uh and most of the time it is actually due to the erosion of the uh, the anterior surface of the contact lens yeah. rather than the actual so lens two itself. years so that's what we tell them um with two years yeah. plus <coughs> one, one one last question dr paul it's little out of the box thinking i never tried it myself but you are an innovator par excellence so if you do get this epical touch or the epical bearing and these patients have a fluorescein stain positive epithelial uh, you know staining and defect if you fit these patients after 4 months or 6 months with a slightly flatter lens would these patients have less ghosting do you find that the ghosting is less because this uh, cone especially the nipple cone if the cone apex is flattened by the scarring does it really make a difference to the quality of vision 
Ah, uh, yes, it can make a big difference because, yeah. in fact, I can remember one particular case of six in my mind where a patient was fitted badly with a, a nipple cone fitted badly. And I thought around the cone, they had some significant scar tissue in the upper one third of the stroma. They, I three fitted them with the nipple cone design, got it fitting well and they were very comfortable, all the staining went. And the scar, what I thought was a permanent scar, reduced uh -huh. dramatically and her vision came down about two lines. So uh -huh. what I thought had been a scar was actually just edema in, in, in the cornea. Uh -huh. All right. Also, going back and answering the question that Jody answered before, uh, how long should lens last? Mm -hmm. I've had patients that made them last 10 years. I've had patients that will look after them so well. I've had other patients that have them every six months. They, right, they've got right. bad hands. They don't look after them. They don't use solutions, as Jody pointed out. So it's very variable. But when I'm asked this question, I would expect with reasonable care that it just the last two years. That would be my my feeling on it. And now I like to see my patients every six months to make sure the lens is still and, uh, fitting correctly on the cornea. But um, I would expect the lens to last with good care uh, at two years. So from our side, thank you so much, Dr. Paul, for making such a huge difference for these patients who are dependent on contact lenses for their whole life. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Actually, actually I have also felt that the you know, the, the lens lasting is very much variable depending upon the care the patient is taking. And most of the times what we felt that, you know, some patients, even after one year, one and a half years, they had so many scratches uh, on the lenses that uh, that they had to, we had to change the lens. And there are the patients after two years also, there's hardly anything on the lens and the surface is quite smooth. So the patient was quite comfortable. So it is quite variable depending upon how well the patient handles it. I have, a, I have a question, Rajesh, uh, for the post keratoplasty cases. So, is it like also for like you have for the rose clay lenses? Every lens is customized, you know, for the patient. Uh, in case of post graft patients who are having variable amounts of astigmatism. So, your question is: with a lot of astigmatism on the cornea, can you still fit the graft? Is that right? Yes. Yes. Um, if you have a lot of astigmatism on, on the graft, particularly oblique, it's a real challenge to fit a corneal lens because often it will not center up and it will often move one way or the other or slide down uh, the axis of the astigmatism. But in some cases, you get a surprise because you basically, with the post-graft corneal lens, you're vaulting across that area and you're landing it on the, uh, the cornea outside of the graft because typically the landing zone is outside eight, eight, eight and a half millimeters. And most graphs around, I understand about eight or eight and a half millimeters. So you're landing it outside the graft, which means that over the center of the graft, you can sometimes get away with a corneal lens. But typically if you have high degrees of astigmatism on the graft, often it's very difficult to get a, a good result with a corneal lens. Yeah, actually in these cases, post graft lenses uh, normally, uh, you know, should work only if the graft rose junction is absolutely regular. But in many of the cases in graft rose jun junction at one point is slightly irregular. It's very steep and then the PG lenses don't work. So we used to fit irregular cornea design in those uh, cases. But there also, in some of the cases, we had, you know, uh, abnormal edge lift, then we did tucking, then that also didn't work. So in such cases, we have moved on to Excel lenses, and uh, they do well yeah, with Excel. So, so from what I understand, in these cases, you would use corneoscleral lenses? I would, yes. I'd go to a corneoscleral lens. Okay. I'm always very careful with any of these large lenses on graphs because I've seen some terrible things happen quite quickly with graphs that haven't been monitored or fitted correctly. The biggest problem that I find with graphs is that the highest area is usually along the edge of the graft, and therefore that causes the lens to decenter towards that area. So typically corneal lenses will move and center over that highest area. Um, so Sometimes it's impossible to get centration because you've got a very high area along the edge of the graft, which causes the, the lens to descend. 
I had no problems going to a corneal scleral lenses for a graft, but I watched them very closely for the first three months to make sure that I'm not doing any damage to that graft at all. Yeah, I would like to add here that, uh, Paul, I've had good success with Roske Soft actually on some of the corneal grafts, uh, uh, which have got high cylinders up to six, seven, uh, um, and uh, the centering uh, with the uh, with the edge design uh, in in five or six steps that you've done us, and with the, the diameter um, way, uh, increasing, you can increase the diameter up to fifteen. Um, I found that uh, the, there is very good success rate in both comfort as well as vision uh, with Rose K Soft. Yeah, as I mentioned, if you look at the, um, the DK over T, so uh, how much oxygen you're getting through the lens, it's very low. Even with a silicon hydrogel material with a DK value uh, you know, of over 100, 150, it can still be very, very low. That's because you've got such a thick lens. Because when we measure DK, we're talking about 0.1 of a millimeter. So if you actually thicken it up to 0.35, you're reducing the amount of oxygen that gets through that lens by three times, three and a half times. So just remember that. So you have to get tear exchange, otherwise you reduce your wearing time. The lens must move over the cornea and you've, you've got to restrict wearing time until you're absolutely sure on graphs, Jody, that, that everything's fine. So your biggest danger with soft lenses is the patient says, oh, this is great. I can see that it's very comfortable. And they don't know what's happening around that edge of that graph. So I'm very careful with graphs, as you can see, um, with, with soft lenses, thick soft lenses. Um, that's why I'm a corneal lens boy. I like to, we know they, they, are, they work on graphs if they can be used. So I always like to try a corneal lens first, but they're not always successful. So you sometimes you have to go to either a soft or, or semi-spheral design. The other concern with these thick soft lenses yeah. that uh, in graphs that uh, they can be hypoxia and that can lead yeah. to polarization and that can lead to you know graph rejection subsequently later. So that is one concern uh, with these uh, thick soft lenses. Uh, I don't know whether, uh, you know, Excel lenses will be better in these cases in comparison to soft. I'm not too sure. I, I guess yeah. Excel may be better. Yeah, if, you, if you tell the patients to remove their lenses every four hours yeah. uh, for a little while and they can wear them up to 12 to 14 hours with breaks of half an hour or one hour, uh, it can work. Uh, I, I've had patients who are wearing Excel lenses over graph for, for the whole day with breaks of half an hour or so. Uh, and it is, the graft is in a good condition. They've been wearing these lenses for almost six, seven years now. So. That brings uh, up another point, Jody, that it's really good if the patient can be without lenses for at least an hour or so before sleeping. Uh, it gives the cornea a chance to recover again, whereas we know that the cornea swells naturally about 4% at night just, just by closed eye. So it's good if, if they can, if they wear their lenses right up the time they go to bed, close their eyes, they've got further uh, edema occurring. So I always say, look, try to take your lens out at least an hour before you, you sleep. Dr. Michael? Oh, well, it was a very nice and lucid presentation, Dr. Paulson. And uh, uh, I have not practiced Roske lens personally, but I have been uh, practicing uh, reverse geometry lenses for my myopia for the last 15 years. And uh, the stepwise approach, what you have advised, is uh, I would like to highlight that it's very important uh, as it makes the fitting very easy. I have a few questions here from you. First is, uh, what is the youngest patient uh, you have to, uh, managed with Roske lens and how fast do these patients uh, adapt to these lenses, sir? A, a good question. And when I first started fitting, I used to see my patients after one week and they were full of moans and groans. And I found that if I left them two weeks, they were often more comfortable. So I make my first check at two weeks and then at one month. Now, if a patient's not doing well at one month, 
I have to think about other options because typically if they're still only wearing them a couple of hours a day and they're, mo and they're, and they're having them complaining about the comfort and the, the problems, if they're not feeling relatively positive after one month, I have to think about some other option for them. Is that your, your experience, Jody, at all? I have fitted a lot of children from the age of 12, 14. And uh, yes, adaptation takes at least two weeks. And uh, once they're adapted, most of the children do extremely well. If you understand all the Indian atmospheric condition, there's a lot of dust flying. And uh, even in schools, colleges, they are, there is a, a, a lot of pollution in the air. Uh, in spite of that, adaptation is only two weeks generally. And uh, yes, uh, if they are not adapted within the first four weeks, and definitely, I, I try to go in for a scleral, uh, an Excel design. Yes, if a patient's not comfortable after a month, you, you tend to have to do something. Otherwise, you lose the patient or they'll, they'll think that you're incompetent. So uh, I made that decision at one month to make the decision. If they're not doing well. I've got to think of some other option, whether it was piggybacking or going to a scleral, going to a thick, soft lens and explaining to the patient why. Um, and so I can remember a few cases where I went to piggybacks and um, and the patient eventually got sick of it, took the soft lens out and just wore the rigid lens. And they came back to me a year later, patients that couldn't tolerate a, a, a rigid lens initially, wearing a rigid lens directly onto the cornea. So the, piggy lens, the, the piggybacking just was a temporary measure to get them initially adapted. But, uh, yeah, a month is my sort of cutoff point. And uh, one more thing I would like to ask, sir. Like uh, this uh, post surgery lenses you have uh, said, so have you had any experience on any uh, case of uh, lacerated wound of uh, corneal laceration repaired? Any such patient being treated uh, with contact lens? A corneal la laceration? Laceration, yes, a peripheral corneal laceration with the pupillary zone, if it is clear. It leads to a lot of irregular astigmatism. It depends, on, it depends on the magnitude of, of the problem. I mean, a cornea that's had a, a, a cut, you know, from limbus to limbus or has significant scarring, very difficult to get a corneal lens to sit on that. But if you've had a foreign body scar, small, that's not uh, causing too much problem, then you can get away with often the post graft design. That's what I would use typically rather than the keratoconic design. The keratic, you, you could understand with the keratoconic design, your central area is steeper and every subsequent curve gets flatter and flatter. So that is a design suited for a shape of cornea that's like a mountain or like a cone or like a volcano. It's not suited to a cornea that's flat centrally um, and then slowly moves out like a, like a graft. It's not, that's why I had to come up with different, different designs. Thank you, sir. Rishi, anything? Yeah, it was an, an engrossing uh, presentation, Dr. Rose, and uh, I greatly enjoyed it. Um, in my own setup, uh, we have technicians who do the contact lens fitting, and they weren't really uh, familiar or comfortable with the Rose case system till about about eight or 10 years ago. And now that they are, um, they are so happy that they accommodated and introduced this. So thank you for all your innovations uh, and bringing this to us. So my um, questions were actually a couple. One was, uh, is there any evidence that the use of these lenses over a period of time actually alters the way the keratoconus behaves or progresses? Uh, is there, uh, you know, like, or, or as a corollary also, I guess, um, some sort of orthokeratology wherein uh, using lenses maybe which are flatter uh, would somehow suppress the cone or make the whole system flatter. Is there, is there any work of that nature? Um, I'm not aware of any studies uh, um, that have done that. It would be quite a difficult study to actually do. But 
my experience with keratokinus, and I don't know how many thousands I've fitted over the years, is that well-fitted and well-monitored and keeping the relationship of the back of the lens to the cornea optimally tends to slow the condition down. And I've seen cases that have been advancing, advancing, advancing. Um, you fitted them optimally, and then they've, they've slowed down. And in some cases, it's arrested the, the, um, the progress of the disease. I, I'd never go out there and say it, it always works because I've seen many cases that you still get advances as well. I would never use it as an orthokeratology simply because to do that, you've got to exert pressure on the cone. And that's where you have your problems, where you've got the epithelium is more unstable, where you can produce scar tissue. So I've heard people say, should we try orthokeratology with uh, cones? Um, it certainly wouldn't be my recommendation. I think your whole idea, and I started that presentation off by saying, we want to do minimal damage to that cornea. We want to fit it as optimally as we can without causing any problems to that cornea. So um, I would not be a fan of trying orthokeratology on keratoconus. Thank you so much, thanks. You're welcome. Raji? Uh, I have one query. Uh, like if you are fitting Excel lenses, what do you think is the ideal uh, post-lens tear film in terms of uh, micrometer on ASOCT? The thickness of the post tier yeah. film? Yeah, yeah. What, what should be ideal? One? Over central? Are you talking centrally? Yeah, with yeah, us? yeah. central. With the spiral lens or the corneal lens? Uh, what the type of lens, uh, Richie? Uh, uh, Excel. Scleral lens. Corneal lens. Corn yeah, yeah. Corneal scleral. Ideally, somewhere between 30 to 60 microns would be my ideal. Now, with scleral lenses, you often not much more than that. You're often 200 microns, uh, 300 microns is not uncommon. In saying that, with oblate corneas fitted with Excel, um, you don't have the option to drop that central area with the current design. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm working on an oblate design for Excel at the moment that drops the sagittal height centrally by about 250 microns. But Excel has been used on oblate corneas where you've had uh, 200, 300 microns clearance uh, and has used, been used successfully. Uh, and I've even seen it up to 450 microns in one case. But if you ask me what I think would be ideal, it's 30 to 60 microns in the Excel design uh, over um, the highest point on the cornea. And for lucid, that's not central, remember. It's going to be, you're going to be measuring it right near the limbus at six o'clock. That's your highest point. Uh, with cones, it depends on where the apex of the cone is. So uh, fitters often make mistake looking at exactly the central tear layer, but that's not where I advocate with a corneal sclera I want to measure. I want to measure it at the point that, that the tear layer is going to be minimal over the highest point on the cornea. Uh, so can I have a request? I'll just have a request. We see a lot of uh, buphthalmic patients with, congenital with uh, primary congenital glaucoma. They have a huge amount of anisometropia. We do a good surgery. We control the pressures, but amblyopia remains, and there's a bleb up there, so we really can't do anything much other than a spectacle correction, which doesn't work. Try your genius at those patients. These children who have uh, operated uh, trabeculectomy for a congenital glaucoma with an isometropia, what type of lenses can we fit? That will be a boom too. So when you talk about children, Professor, typically young children, are we talking very about? Young, very young, very young, very young, ranging of... from six months to three years of age or to five years of age. Like these have operated glaucoma for uh, congenital glaucoma. And they have clear corneas. I mean, initially we used to get these bad patients with scarred corneas. Now when we are getting clear corneas, but we are not able to visually rehabilitate them because they have so much of an isometropia. Particularly babies. Um, I used to go to the hospital and fit um, a fake at children um, after surgery. Um, immediately I measured them and fit them up. And then, the, but you had to get the parents aboard 
for me, the success of contact lenses is convincing the parent how important it is for babies to have good vision at that early stage. So, uh, and that would be my experience that parents make or break often whether a child will be successful in a, in a, in a lens. Depends what you're dealing with, what the cornea is like, but if the cornea is in good condition, um, certainly something like the, um, the post graft lens can work quite well. You no, need it a, doesn't. Um, no, it doesn't because there's a blab up. You know, there's a superiorly at the superior limbus, there's a trabeculectomy blab. So you, okay. you need a very short diameter lens, and, but that's very difficult to center on the child. So what do you tend to use, Professor? I, we don't. We, we don't. We just try to use spectacles. With, I'm just saying, try your genius at making another innovation in these patients, too, children. So even a, a, a corneal spiral or spiral doesn't work with these patients? It can't, because then the bleb would fail. If you put a corneal spiral, it's going to straddle the limbus, and then the bleb would start failing then. Then the whole purpose of will be defeated, because you control the glaucoma with that surgery. Now you need to rehabilitate the amblyopia, anisometropic amblyopia. So it's a challenging situation, so if you could. I guess with uh, RGP material, uh, it is very difficult to, you know, fit such cases, even if it's a corneal lens or any anything, because it will hit the bleb and cause damage to the bleb. So I, I, I think even with the soft material, it will get lifted and uh, it is difficult to do. With the contact lens, I guess. Uh, One thing, Professor, which I haven't touched on, this is a very basic lecture without going to complicated options. There is something in the Excel design called um, segment specific act. That is where you can lift the lens. I can show you a case history if we had time where you actually, the edge of the lens is lifted over the blend. So the edge of the lens comes along, it goes over the, over the bleb and out again. It's called segment-specific ACT. So you'd, you'll define a segment. Uh, it can be a challenge sometime to manufacture, and it has manufacturing limitations, which probably Jody can help you with, um, with, with, with the lab. Sure, sure. We could try but, that. Yeah. But typically, uh, you, you might choose an arc of 60 degrees. And so mm -hmm. the lens comes along, and then it starts lifting... 30 degrees either side of where that bleb is, and it mm -hmm. lifts very high over that bleb. Okay. So that and, won't uh, touch the lid because what we were normally using this edge lifting was for the lower lid. Now here it's the upper lid, which is blinking all the time. Yeah, but then it won't actually matter. If the lens is fitting correctly on the cornea and resting there, it's not going to sink back more than 10 typically about 20 microns. And mm -hmm. that usually happens in the first 20 minutes of the lens being on the eye. So it will exert pressure on that bleb for sure, unless you do something special in that area. And so I do have a design to deal with that. A segment specific act, ACT. And you actually, the edge of the whole edge of the lens outside the limbus is lifted over that area. It vaults over it. That's right. Would you have a case, uh, Paul, to show us? Uh, Rajesh, do you think uh, there is time for about three minutes or so, Paul? Sorry, Jody? Would you have that case uh, regarding that blab which you had done? Um, would you Ooh, have... I might... Do you want me to see if I can find it? Yeah. That might be a challenge, but uh, give me a moment and I'll have a look. I... Do we have enough time, Rajesh? That's a lovely case, which uh, Paul yeah. But if Paul can find it, and... advanced fittings. Uh... Sorry, I'm just squinting through it now just to see if I can find it. Um, yes, here it is here. Okay, let's see if I can go back to finding you now.
but I guess, uh, uh, Kirti, ma'am, it's it's really going to be it's a big challenge for a case wherein you have a blab. To... Okay. No, it's okay. You just I, I ask the questions. I just gave him a suggestion if you could find something for these children, that would be great. You just mm. it is of course uh, that is why it's Dr. Paul who can do it. He 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 yeah. can take up challenges. Okay, here's the case here. Um, you can see the shunt here. You can see here's the bleb superiorly here. So if we magnify it up, here's the bleb right here. If you put a normal XL on this eye, you can see it's pushing on the bleb. We're getting no fluorescin over that area at all. So what I decided to do, that the, this was my the first time I ever did this design, uh, XL segment specific ACT. And the fitter said to me, okay, I want standard lift here. I want standard lift here. I want extra lift between 30 and 80 degrees. And the smaller you make that arc, the more difficult it is for the lab to manufacture it. So I think we had to eventually go to 70 degrees to actually be able to cut the lens. And he wanted a plus two increase lift here as well. So he, he wanted uh, quadrant specific edge lifts, but he wanted ACT in this portion here. So normal act, when you all organize, uh, if you've ever used my designs and you go with normal act, it actually changes over 180 degrees. So if you decide that you want ACT at 270, it starts changing here and here, and it slowly gets steeper and steeper until the maximum steepness is at six o'clock or 270. So here is the lens with this segment specific act. And you can see now we're not exerting any pressure at all over that bleb. Um, we, we are landing the, 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 the lens on the cornea without exerting pressure on the bleb. Um, it does have cutting, cutting limitations, um, and uh, uh, the lab can tell you what they can do. They'll say, oh, yes, we can put a, a, a one uh, ACT on there, but we have to make it 60 degrees or whatever it is. So, um, yeah, so that is the case there, uh, Professor. Uh, and uh, this patient was um, um, in Italy, actually. This was uh, not, my, not my case. This was sent to me from an Italian fitter who, uh, who had asked me to design something. This goes back probably um, about eight years, uh, eight years ago. So when you were talking about it. That, that's terrific, sir, because I mean, that's, that's the tube shunt. What I was talking about was a trabeculectomy blame, but I think we should uh, stop this conversation because I believe a lot of other questions are there. This is a tube shunt and that you can fit, but not over a blame which is at the limbus. That was the problem. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Rajiv? Uh, indeed, it is an excellent presentation by Paul. Uh, I'm not a great contact lens fitter myself, but a lot of my Ectasia patients are on mini spiral lenses. And I do see a lot of, uh, as you showed in one of your slides, uh, we do see a lot of uh, limbal ischemia or limbal blanching of the vessels, not ischemia. So is there anything that we can do for these patients uh, so that we don't get this kind of blanching even after they remove their lenses? Number one. Number two is that... Uh, if you're doing an OCT, what kind of a wall should be looking at at the limbus or maybe just anterior to the limbus in the spiral lenses? Um, with, <clears throat> with a corneal spiral, are you talking about my design? You're talking about scleral lenses? Many spiral. Many sclerals. So are you talking about sclerals that vault the cornea or you're talking about a corneal scleral that lands inside the limbus? It lands beyond the limbus or at the limbus. I'm talking about 14 to 16 uh, mm lenses. Okay, if you're looking at a corneal spiral like my design, you're looking at um, only about 20 microns actually over that limbal area. It will actually look like it's touching. If you're talking uh, a scleral design, they tend to want to go towards about 100 microns, I understand, for most scleral design and get reasonably good clearance. The biggest problem, if you have too much clearance over the limbus with a scleral design, it tends to suck that conjunctiva back under. And so um, they, they suggest if you're getting uh, corneal uh, conjunctival prolapses, 
that you change that vault over the limbus uh, to, to to less than that. But for me, it's uh, it's it's probably 10 to 20 microns. It's very small clearance over the limbus. And when I first came up with XL, people said to me, aren't you concerned about the stem cells of the limbus, about landing the lens near the limbus? And I must admit I was. I wonder, have I actually got a problem here? I don't know how many thousands of XLs have been fitted around the world now, and I have not had any reports of being an issue. So I assume it's not a big issue at all, landing that lens close to the limbus, uh, as long as it's fitted correctly. Um, you know, for me, people, uh, my answer again to that was saying, actually with a scleral lens where you seal the lens off typically, that's going to cause more problems to those stem cells um, than actually having a lens that lands close to it. And with the correct fitting a corneal scleral, you get tear exchange right up to the limbus. So you're refreshing those tears right up to the limbus. So I'd be more, more concerned about causing damage to those stem cells with a scleral lens than I would the corneal scleral lens. And, and how do you go about managing or changing parameters to avoid lingual blanching? So in, in XL, that is set. You can't actually do anything. You just, you fit it by going uh, the highest. So it's like all my designs, you do, you do the base curve and you look at it at the highest point on the cornea that controls it. Then you land it and there is a controlled angle that goes out from the landing point over the limbus. You can't control that. That's controlled by the design. But it will give you typically between 10 to 10 to 20 microns clearance over that nimble area. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. So I think uh, we are through with the, there are no more questions. Uh, Rishi had told us to make, Rishi, what did you tell us to make? Repo. Repo. So I tried to make one today. I don't know whether I would uh, you know, succeed. Maybe after the meeting, I can show it to you all. No problem. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, to participate. And uh, I hope it's been useful and there's been, you've taken, if you take away one or two little things, that's it's all been worthwhile. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul. Uh, it's been a wonderful presentation. We've taken away more than a few things, uh, believe me. And uh, I thank you also for, you know, it's, I'm sure it's past midnight there. Uh, and uh, I thank you so much for the time. I'll be sleeping in tomorrow morning for sure. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye to you all. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you so much. Uh, Good night. I really Good thank night. Night. Paul night. for uh, you know agreeing for this. Sir Titiyal sir would like to say something. Well, Rajesh, we had a great discussion. And, uh, I think uh, something to complete the series which we have started uh, uh, in this particular session. I think contact lenses are uh, difficult for all of us and uh, for a people general ophthalmologist is, uh, is uh, you know, too uh, specialized and uh, it should not be taken very lightly because it is the uh, one of the most specialized area for us, and it should be fitted by the people who know the you know actual the concept of a contact lens to that cornea. As Dr. Namata was asking, customization of uh, lenses. Yeah, we do have uh, some sort of customization can be done in these lenses also. In, in the design, especially edge uh, making in these cases, tucking, all those things can be done. But I understand, you know, as uh, Paul talked about, the long-term follow-up is very, very critical for these cases. Because many complications would arise if we you know, don't see these patients regularly. And especially if you're looking for a difficult fitted patients or a post uh, uh, keratoplasty patient. Kitty was asking about post cross link patients. And uh, there are people who fit contact lenses, uh, you know, within a first, uh, uh, within a first three months of uh, cross linking. And uh, there have been few reports where the flattening has increased uh, compared to those patients where they have not uh, used contact lenses. So sort of an ortho -K type of practice people do so that you get much more flattening in a cross link keratoconus also. And uh, I think uh, subsequently then we can have one session where we talk about routine fitting also. 
because there we should have people have a knowledge on our routine contact lenses also because that is also being practiced by many many of our practitioners and we can take i know help of uh, jyoti or monica uh, for uh, at least getting knowledgeable uh, uh, people into our discussion yeah. Yes, um, uh, Dr. Titiyal, it's, uh, I think it's very, very important that uh, the ophthalmologist works very closely with the optometrist. Now, we have done many, many, many courses for the optometrist to have developed this skill. And um, in fact, you will be surprised how many optometrists are there um, who can actually take over a lot of your load uh, in the contact lens department. So uh, <laughs> they have taken all the load. <laughs> there are very, very few, you uh, know, ophthalmologists. Uh, we, I, I can see Kirti is very keen on the contact lens. Otherwise, uh, Rajesh and uh, we have few faculty in RP center. But you go across other places, there will be hardly anyone. The like PGI Chandigarh one, the people are there. You must have seen other places. There, you can hardly pick up people practicing uh, the uh, right way to practice contact lens. Yes, They'll be pra practicing soft contact lenses. That's why I'm, I'm telling, you know, we should have one session to give them actual knowledge on the basic uh, fittings and basic contact lenses, which many think, people uh, practice. I, I think okay. also, I think uh, in the curricula, uh, in uh, in PG teaching, uh, we were never really trained how to go, do contact lens fitting. And I think that is one lacuna that we should now at least fill so that uh, our younger colleagues at least should get exposed uh, properly in contact lens fitting. Yeah, we do. We do in our yes. center. We have a, a session on contact lenses. Always we have in the curriculum, and they're posted in the contact lens clinic, where they are seeing the patients being fitted. But I agree with Dr. Tetyal that not many centers are doing it. Mostly it is soft lens fitting, and the other ones you know are just relegated. So this this renaissance is really important, and especially with Dr. Paul uh, rose K lens is coming in. This renaissance started more than a decade ago, and we need to, you know, jump on it and get more ophthalmologists involved. True, true, I true, just, Rajesh, yeah. I just um, uh, wrote these points down, which Rishi has been insisting right from several of our webinars as to what these yeah. points are. An important yeah, point please, of please. Uh, important point by uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Jyoti Dave that optometrist and ophthalmologist co-management is useful. Then ASOCT guided contact lens fitting is used for some cases, although it is time consuming. Then modifications in the edge of the contact lens has made a difference. And then there was discussion on the collagen cross-linking, how corneas become flatter, the post-op comfort becomes uh, better. Then in Indian situations for how do long do they last and contact lens care is so important. Then again, in the post graft eyes and we also mentioned about exchange of tears. And also the fact that both Jyoti and Dr. Paul said that before sleeping, the contact lenses should be off for at least one hour. And then he talked about the design on Keiko Nick design as well. Of course, ortho ortho K, he was not very fond of it because he said that that can damage the cornea. And segment specific ACT, I think again, this is something we all learned. I had no clue about this. So this was something which was new. So th that is it. And this is apart from, you know, what Dr. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Paul talked about. And I know that. <laughs> so thank you, ma'am, for uh, doing this and for summarizing. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Very good. I'm impressed. Yeah, so... Very good. That's why I was not talking. I was doing this. <laughs> <laughs> so Very good. in the end, I would like to thank you all, all the panelists, especially Jyoti for helping us in organizing, Professor Kirti Singh, Dr. Srikant Vaikar, of course, our own uh, president, vice president, treasurer, and chairman scientific committee, everyone. And I would like to thank Bageshwar and Anil for helping us, especially Bageshwar, who has really worked for it. And of course, the team of IPCA who have uh, supported this webinar. So thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you, Rajesh, for organizing this uh, and Dr. Tretyal, sir. I think uh, we've moved into another uh, level now that uh, we are having it almost on every Friday. 
and someday also now the international webinar which we have today. So I think thank you very much and thank you for bringing uh, contact lenses back. Uh, it has been a focus. If you recall in all our annual meetings, we've always had contact lens workshops and we've always had a session where we were doing uh, hands-on and wet labs for contact lens uh, fittings. And I think uh, this is a welcome step in that direction and a very good, uh, very good talk as well. So thanks Rajesh. Thanks uh, Jeevan and Namrata and all the panelists. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Enjoy the evening, yeah. <laughs> you are all independent now. <laughs> Enjoy the evening, Namrata. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay.